Hello, my name is Larry Tatum. In this particular tape, we're going to study punching and how it's used in Kempo. Now, first off, we're going to use it from a horse stance. We're going to develop our punching from a horse position. Assume the horse stance, cock your hands to your hip, as we've done in the previous tapes. And the first punch that I want to work is called a front thrust punch. Now, the front thrust punch involves a lot of principles in there. And that as we go to punch, and when we refer to punching, we're referring to the two forward knuckles. So now as we punch, we're going to bring the arm out until the elbow reaches the end of the rib cage. At that point, I want you to begin to torque it, turn the punch until it's locked into position. I want you to keep your shoulders square, particularly in the early stages of your training. That doesn't mean that we'll use this, we won't use this later on. We will. But at this point now, as you begin to punch, Keep your shoulders square and torque it into position. Now, from a side view, as you execute the punch, make sure that your wrist remains flat on top. If you connect on a target with your wrist like this, it's going to break. Obviously, the same thing if it's bent this direction, you're going to break it this way. So make sure that that wrist is flat on top when you connect. Now, the power from this punch in the arm alone comes from the torque. Now, what happens when you twist that arm? People say, well, it's the torque gives it the power. Well, it's not entirely true. What happens is the torque suddenly accelerates the arm. And the faster that you go with a strike, a punch, block, kick, whatever, the harder it's going to hit, the more power that's going to be generated. So as you begin to bring it out, just as your elbow gets to the end of the rib cage, at that point, emphasize the torque right there. And that'll accelerate the punch. When you're practicing, I want you to punch, punch to the center of your body, that center line. We'll draw a little triangle out, and we'll punch to that line. Again, it's called a front thrust punch. When you get comfortable with one arm, and you can return it back on the same level, keep your fist tightly closed, then I want you to alternate, and as one goes out, the other one comes back simultaneously, so that they lock into place at the same time. One locks here, and the other one locks forward. All right, now, in fastening your hand to create the punch, open your hand straight up, palm out, bend your fingers down, and twist the skin. Actually grab yourself inside so that it's tightly closed. Wrap your thumb on top and around in this position. Now, some people like to stick that, ex that index finger out and do it this way. Some even like to do it with two fingers out this way. But at this stage, I want you to do it as the way I asked you to fashion it. Okay, now, I want you to look at your punch as a weapon. Okay, usually when we hear the word punch, for some reason, it sounds like a more humane way of striking. But a strike is a strike, no matter if it's a punch or if it's an elbow at the edge of your hand. How much power and how much speed that you give to the strike depends upon the situation. And we're going to learn more about power as we go along. Now, if we take it from a neutral position, and you watch it from a side view, you're going to start with your hand. Some people like to start all the way down on the hip. Some people like to start up here. Okay, I prefer just comfortable at the waist. But as you begin to turn, and when your elbow gets at the end of the rib cage from a neutral position, I want you to use your forward bow. Because now, we're not just adding power of the arm, but we're adding marriage of gravity, shifting that weight. And as we strike and hit, He's not getting hit just with the arm, but he's getting hit with the entire focus of the body. And you notice that I finished my torque and I finished my pivot in my stance at the same time. All right, now this is important. Now there's an analogy drawn from here. That if a truck slammed on his brakes prior to hitting a brick wall, and just as the br brakes caught and the bumper just hit the brick wall, and it only hit it within, it went inside the wall an inch. What hit the wall? Did the truck hit the wall or did the bumper hit the wall? Well, most people would say, well, the bumper hit the wall. But it was the entire truck that hit. All right, now that's important because when you hit somebody and you put on the brakes, I don't just want the arm hitting the target, but as the brakes are put on, I want the entire truck, or in this case, yourself, to connect with that target. And that's what we call body focus. Now, that front thrust punch should be practiced from a horse stance, from a neutral to a forward bow. It should be practiced with 
thrusting, and a thrust indicates that you're locking the arm out into position. A snapping punch, what happens when you snap is that as you reach the point of impact, you pull it back. And you pull it back faster than it went out. So a snapping, thrust, a snapping punch would look more like this. It go, comes back a little faster than it went out. I want you to practice both. If you look at it from another angle, when I snap this punch here, it goes in, and then right back out again. All right, good. Now, when we change punches, it's usually the situation that forces us to change the punch. All right, now for instance, Rick, can I use your help here? Did you go down to a horse, please, for me? Now, if you start from a neutral position and you watch my punch, if Rick is this far from my fist, then obviously I'm going to reach almost full extension by the time I hit Rick. Okay? Now, if I'm closer to Rick, quite obviously I don't want to do this because now I'm actually retarding the power of the punch. So what would happen is, is that I would get about a quarter turn in the fist. Well, that's fine, because what's important is, it's not that you torque the fist completely over to get maximum power, because you can break bricks boards if you want to get involved in that, and you don't have to make a full twist to do it. The important thing is, is that the punch is synchronized with the weight of your body, or what we call body fusion. That's when the fist and the body are united together, and it's entire body focus, whether it be a complete torque, or whether it be just a quarter turn. All right? Now, if Rick had his guard up and we were freestyling, sparring back and forth, one target is so far back out of range that I'm going to need a full torque to reach it. Another target is close enough where a quarter turn will be perfect. And yet, another target, and I include the defense that he's putting up as a target, is close enough for where you would strike and you wouldn't even get a quarter turn, but you would have an inverted fist if you could switch your stance. Now, if I choose, if I'm still out of range, then this is where I can go beyond where my shoulders go square, as I taught you earlier. And from that point, then I can drop in and use an inverted punch. And all that is is a little bit of torque just a little further to get me to reach into the target. So what we're finding out now some people have the misconception that full power is generated at full extension. That's not the case. What gives you full power is, is if you can keep your body united with that weapon. And you keep your momentum going in that direction. All right, now, if you could switch your stance again. Punching is fine. It's a great way of striking. It's probably the most common way. Depending upon how a person was raised, how their environment was, dictates what type of weapons people choose and pick. Uh, people like to clasp their fists together because uh, psychologically it has a way of building up your own energy. You feel strong because you're grabbing something. All that power is being pushed into your fist and that's what you want to strike with. Okay? The more adapt, get more experience and realize, well, there's other ways of striking without closing your fist. That's fine, but generally that's what we're going to start with on this tape here is working on this punch. Now, punches can be in a straight line, which is fine, and that is the shortest distance between two points. But that doesn't always mean that you're going to be able to hit that target with a straight line. When we punch, we punch not only the targets furthest from us, but as I said earlier, we'll pick a target that may be close to us, such as his fist or so forth. And as I punch into it, my idea is to punch his defense down. And from that point, if I choose to go on, and pick another target, I can shuffle in as we've learned earlier and strike. I can cross in and strike from here. All right, but you'll notice now, as I'm changing my punching, it's no longer torquing all the way over. Well, in a punch, you want to strike with your two knuckles. That's the hardest part of the fist at this point. If I use a complete torque in a front thrust, and I go higher than my own shoulder, what's going to hit first are going to be my knuckles. And I'll probably break them and bruise them up. doesn't mean it won't hurt him, but it's going to hurt me as well. So what I want to do, if I have to go higher than my own shoulder and still connect with my knuckles, is I then only turn halfway 
into what's called a vertical fist. And that assures that I'm going to hit with those two knuckles. All right. Now, another interesting concept, especially in sparring, and I'm going to mention that now because we are going to have a tape on that. But if I go to strike Rick into the ribs, and I torque that punch all the way over, and he blocks it before I get there, it stays blocked. If Rick blocks and I use a diagonal punch, no matter if he blocks it, I can still bend from the elbow and still get up into my target. All right, so knowing your choice of punches, it's very important. It's extremely important. Now, Rick, if you'd come over here, please. Just go down to horse for me. Now, as we strike in a punch, like I said, right in the beginning, you're learning how to use them in a linear or straight line situation. But as we go along, I want you to learn how to, how to circle the punches as well. This punch is a vertical punch, but now it's a hooking or a roundhouse punch, depending if you go straight out and then hook it this way, or if you come in from the outside, from the outside in. It's still considered a punch in the Kempo system if you're using these knuckles in that fashion. All right, now, if you could switch your stance. Like I said, if my rear hand can't reach, but my front hand is almost there, I may purposely want to shuffle in and hook or roundhouse, and just as I reach the apex of that circle, my left hand now becomes a vertical punch at this point, because I want those two knuckles to hit, okay? As I step back and don't want something to chase me, then I can use what's considered a downward punch and go right to the bicep. Again, I'm showing you targets most people don't think about. They always think of this area. But now we're picking and choosing targets in a different way. That's also important. Let's take a situation where I'm on my knees down at the beach. And Rick comes up, switch your stance, Rick, and shoots a kick. Now, I can parry it, block it, and I can punch it this way. If you watch that a little slower, as the kick came up, so now I used a vertical punch here. Now if I want to cross myself, I can step drag, even from a kneel position. And we learned to step drag in the other tape. I can step up, go to a rib at this point. Now a straight line won't reach, but this hook type of punch will. Now this is just to give you a variety of ideas. Thank you, Rick. Now, <coughs> practice your punches from a horse stance, a full torque halfway, diagonal, and just to your elbow. It doesn't turn at all. Practice it full, and then a complete inverted, and then back. Practice them snapping, practice them thrusting. This will give you an idea of how punching works in Kempel. Now we finish the punches, let's go right into strikes. And I'm going to stay with hand strikes. In other words, when I say hands, refers to from here all the way up to the shoulders. So any part of my arm all the way down to the last fingertip could be considered a strike. All right, now I'm going to start with what's called a hand sword, and I, it's commonly known as a chop. But a hand sword is very common in the art, and it's considered a very lethal way of striking. But like I said, even punching it does, is lethal. It doesn't matter. It's, it's how you use the strike itself. Now a hand sword, is no more than taking your hand, holding the fingers straight up, put them together, and bend them back just a little bit. And what this does is it puts tension on the palm of your hand. It makes the hand strong. Take your thumb, pull it into the side, and that's one method. That's the most common method of doing a hand sword. In Kempo, we go a little step further. We take these two fingers and we bend them down because now that flexes this part of the hand. It's like flexing your muscle, you're going to flex all of the muscles in your fingers, all of the muscles in your hand. We, might, we call this the Kempo hand. Okay? It's usually synonymous for most Chinese styles of fighting. It's a kind of an all-purpose hand sword, and I'll show you later how the fingers, the thumb, and so forth can also be used as weapons. But we're considering now the edge of the hand. It's called a hand sword because there was a period of time when uh, teachers back in uh, ancient uh, Oka, times Okinawa, China, and so forth. They didn't have guns. And warlords would confiscate their weapons, their farm tools, so nothing could be used against them. 
So they would fashion their hand in by pounding bricks, boards, straw wrapped in rope, and so forth, until they developed strong calluses on the edges of their hands. They were strong enough that they could hit full force without hurting their hand. All right, now this is not necessary for today because, well, most of your attackers on the streets today don't wear bamboo armor, and you don't have to break through it. But when they do, then I'll start teaching my students how to condition their hands to go through bamboo armor. But for our needs, we're just going to keep it as such. All right, now, you've got a bone here that runs straight down the part of your hand. You don't want to hit with that. You want to strike so that the meat of your hand rolls over to give that bone some cushion, some protection. So we're going to start an inward hand sword. Cock it up to your ear, like so. Fingers are flexed, so the hand is flexed. It's like an inward block as it comes across. All right? But I don't want you to go all the way over facing the other shoulder. I want you to stop right at the center line. And you're chopping with this part of your hand, right in here. As you practice it, synchronize and drop your weight so that you have marriage of gravity at this point. That's an inward hand sword. Now, like the inward block that comes from the hip, which is called a thrusting inward, you can also thrust your hand sword from the hip. So practice them both ways, from this position as well as from this position. All right, now that's the inward hand sword. I'm going to go right into the next one, which is called an outward hand sword, because I'm going to use them together as Rick helps me demonstrate this. Now, the outward hand sword, I want you to cock your right hand across from your left ear, fingers are flexed, and move it out to the center of your body. That's an outward, because basically, if we kept going, it would be considered an outward motion. Drop your weight, synchronize yourself as you do this strike. All right, so we have an inward hand sword and an outward hand sword. Now, if you look at it from another position, from a left neutral bow, I cock it up to my ear, and as I practice it, I can use my forward bow to accentuate that and to help me drop and possibly reach my target. Now, when I strike, I don't lock my elbow out, because if you hit something with a locked elbow, you're going to break your own elbow. It acts as a fulcrum against it. The elbow works against itself. So what you want is to make contact with a slight bend in your elbow. That way you're going to protect yourself. And let me tell you something about striking. Hitting somebody completely with a straight out arm is fine, but it doesn't hit with the same impact as hitting somebody with a bent arm. Remember that. But use your, for your neutral bow into suddenly you drop in pop, to your forward bow. Use it the same way with an outward hand sword. It'll help you a little bit. You can use it from a neutral. You can practice it that way. You can practice it from a cat stance. Okay? You can cross over with the hand sword in either direction. All right. As I showed, you can use many stance maneuvers with it. Also, you can use a reverse bow. You can start from a neutral and go to reverse bow and strike with an outward hand sword. Okay? You can step through. Practice stepping through and hitting with an inward hand sword. Practice stepping back and using a, an outward hand sword, using it this way. Okay? All right, now, this gives you some ideas. You can take any of the foot maneuvers. I don't have to go through all of them, but you can take any of them and practice a hand sword or any strike, any punch with it. All right, that's universal. All right, now, with the help of Rick, I'm going to give you some a little more examples how the hand swords can be used. <coughs> Rick, would you come over here, please? Just face me in a horse. Now, Rick's going to be an ideal help here. He's going to set a position so that you can see what we're talking about. Now, this would be considered an inward hand sword. This would be considered an outward hand sword. It just so happens that the target stops it from going out. Okay? But now, when I said don't strike with your elbow totally locked, not only can you hurt yourself with it, but you lose recovery time. And what I mean by recovery time is that if I strike Rick here and my elbow is bent, I can quickly bring it over to the other side without losing a beat. All right, that's important. When my arm is straight, I have to unbend it to get moving again. Now, we have uh, hand swords that are the palm are facing Rick here, the outward, the back of the hand's facing. Now, that doesn't mean to say that this is the only side of the sword. This is a two-edged sword. So that if I move from here, I can invert that hand sword 
From here, come back, back to the groin, shoot up to the throat, and then I can reverse it and back to this side. Now that gives you an idea. So if we count them, we have one, two, three, four, and five at that point. Now this gives you an idea of how they can be used. If this guard is up, hand swords are good, like punches, in that they can strike to knock the guard out of position. And if you don't want to punch from this angle, you can, you can shuffle in, step drag in, and what? And hand sword from this position. Okay, now ideally hand swords fit around the neck, underneath the neck, across the bridge of the nose. There's many ways that we're going to learn when we get into the tape where we do self-defense techniques. But this gives you an idea. Good. Thank you, Rick. Now, according to um, written history and tra tradition, is that the Chinese were the ones that came upon and discovered the original eight angles of attack. And all that is, is, like I said in one of the earlier tapes, is that you picture a circle in front of you. You have 12, 6, 9, and 3, 2, and 8, 10, and 4 o'clock. Now, those are the angles that you strike on. You can come up vertically. You can come across horizontally. You can come down diagonally. You can go up diagonally. You can come down to this diagonal and up this diagonal. Then you can go straight in. All right, now, since you're using two hands, you have nine on each one, not just eight, because you have that center line that goes through. But since you're using two hands, two, time, two times nine is 18. So it was called originally the 18 hand striking angles. We still use that today because basically those are the angles that we work on. It doesn't mean that each angle can't be separated into degrees. But this is the most balanced angle of strikes that we can work on. All right, now, so keep that in mind because I'm going to keep referring to that later on throughout the tapes. Now, as I go on from the hand sword, I'd like to go in into the elbows, and then I'll come back up to the forearms. Now, the elbow strike is the strongest weapon that you have with your hands. Later on, you'll find out the strongest weapon in your entire body is the knee. That's, that's the king of strength. Right, but with, as far as your hands go, the elbow is the strongest. It's one of the shortest weapons, so it has to be used at the right time, generally in close fighting. Although, as we'll find out, that an elbow strike can be used to block with as well, and if the po opponent is coming in, it can be used to block kicks and this type of thing. But in the most cases, on an offensive situation, you have to be pretty close to use it. All right, so like I, we're finding out that every movement has a consequence. It's powerful, but you've got to get in close to use it. All right, now I want you to learn these elbow strikes, and I'm going to pick the ones at this stage that I think you should practice. We'll start from a horse again. I want you to bring your right hand up as if you're going to do an uppercut punch. Just as your elbow reaches the end of your rib cage, start torquing the fist towards you so the palm will be facing your right cheek as the elbow comes straight up. It's no more than bringing it up and torquing it up. And it has its own little bit of torque. That helps, helps it and gain some power in there as well. Watch again. You come up, torque it, and back. So it's one motion like this. It's called an upward elbow. All right, now. A downward elbow would be what? Basically the reverse of that, that's all. Upward, downward. Then if we keep going on the circle, we have what's called an inward overhead elbow. You remember that center line I was talking about earlier when we used the upward block? Well, here we're going to use that center line again. This is called an inward overhead elbow. Then we have an outward overhead elbow. All right? We have an inward elbow. It's inward horizontal. Now, from any one of these strikes, we always have a back elbow strike. Now, I want you to watch some of these moves that I'm doing. From a right neutral bow, we have an upward elbow, downward elbow, an inward overhead elbow, an outward overhead elbow, an inward elbow, horizontal, an outward elbow, and what? A back elbow. And those are the ones I want you to start learning at this tape at this time. Okay, now, with the help of Rick, I'm going to demonstrate just a little bit how the elbows, if you go down to a horse, Rick, so they can see, can be used in a circular motion as well as a, a linear motion. 
Remember I said earlier, you have to get in close enough for this elbow to work. So we can shuffle. Catch Rich, Rick here, what's this called? An upward elbow. Now my downward elbow pop, works immediately from there. And you notice that when I worked on Rick at this point, all I did was move about six, seven inches down, used a little bit of marriage of gravity, and that brought Rick down and worked on his height zone. That's a new term. We're going to learn about it later, but remember it. As I worked on his height zone, it allowed me to come down and come over to this side. So we had upward, downward, inward, outward, and so forth. All right. Now look at it from a different angle. Or let's look at it from a fighting position. If I managed to get in close enough with Rick, if I shuffled in and punched, and he came in with the other arm, the elbow can come up and not only strike Rick, but can act as a block for that arm. So as that hits there, it can come across and connect. Now you watch my hand as I'm moving with an elbow strike. If I hit here, now watch my left hand. As that right punch comes up, what's this hand doing? But this is actually bracing or becoming the cutting board for the elbow up here. That's one thing hitting somebody with an elbow strike and letting him ride. It's strong itself. But if you back it up with the heel of your hand, the opposite hand, then all the energy is centered directly into his head. That's called a sandwiching elbow. You look at it in the air, it's no more than this. All right, so like I said, if you go down to a horse, I said we can work an upward, down, and then right from that downward, into the sandwich. No sooner I get off the sandwich here, but I'm right back with an outward elbow. Now, earlier we were also speaking about, in the other tapes, about blocks and how we use an upper and lower case type of motion. If Rick fakes a punch, but then at the last moment dives to tackle me, okay, the lower case of my inward block becomes an elbow strike. Okay. Now, if I also take, switch your stance, please. If he does an overhead strike, and I do, what's this called? An out, upward block, and it lets it slip down. Okay. Go ahead. If we do this and let it slip, then we have a downward elbow from this point. Make sure you keep your bottom hand checking the groin area in case something comes up. And basically, that elbow was the reverse motion of what? of an upward block. All right. So a lot of the moves are disguised within another basic. And this is how I want you to start looking at Kempel. All right, now let's take a different situation. Again, we're back down on the ground. And I'll show you that as things get in close, if Rick shoots a kick, I can parry and strike with an upward elbow from that point. Now, if he shoots a kick in, go ahead and do it again, a little deeper, I can step up and catch the groin in that position. All right, now, later on, you'll find out if Rick shoots a roundhouse kick with his right leg and I make a block, come on back, not only can I block it, but I can strike it. What kind of elbow is that? But that's an inward diagonal elbow because it's going up at an angle to meet, to meet the knee. Now, if we take it a step further, I can come up, right, pop, and come down with a downward elbow on the outside of the knee or into the thigh, depending upon what I need. And from that point there, you guessed it, right into the kidneys, wherever we want to add it. Thank you, Rick. Good. What I'd like you to do now is take those elbow strikes and put them with your foot maneuvers. Practice them from a neutral bow. Practice them with a shuffle. Okay, another shuffle. Bam. All right. Step through. Practice them this way. Practice them with a shuffle into a wide kneel and drop, what's this called? But an inward overhead elbow. Practice it that way. Practice it coming into a cat stance. What is this, an inward overhead elbow as we go to the cat stance? Practice the elbow. You'll find that I have, and many other Kempo martial artists, that's a very versatile weapon. Very powerful, very fast. But remember, you've got to get in close to use it. The next strike I want to work on is called a heel palm or a palm heel. Now, it's a tremendous weapon, and one of the reasons I like it is that there's really no wrist involved 
And when I say involved in the strike, is that we're using the heel of the hand to strike with, or even the center of the palm. But the point of it is, when you use a punch, and if you have a small wrist, and some people do, you have a tendency of that wrist is going to buckle under its own pressure. All right, the pressure of the punch. If you use the heel palm to strike with, there is no wrist to bend. It's like the blunt end of a stick or a hard instrument. Now, there's a number of ways that it could be used. I want to first strike, start out with thrusting the heel palm strike, and it looks like a punch in delivery, but we're using the heel of the hand to hit with. Now, the important thing to do is, just like you learned on the hand sword, is to pull your fingers back so that you flex the entire hand, the fingers, the palm of the hand, and all the way down your wrist. You'll feel this down into your forearm. But when you flex it, then you execute it just like you would a punch. When the elbow comes to the end of the rib cage, you torque it over and strike with the heel of the hand. It's as simple as that. It's just like taking a stick and twisting it into your opponent. Now, practice it like you would a punch. As one comes back, the other one comes out. And it's nice with this particular technique that you do a little bit of fighting pressure, tensing up, tensing up. This helps strengthen the muscles, which in turn give you more speed. All right, this is a nice exercise, nice way to practice it, and so forth. Now, you can be delivered thrusting straight out. They can be delivered in a reigning position, or arcing down on your opponent, such as the bridge of the nose, which I'm going to show you in a few moments. They can be delivered horizontally. They can be delivered diagonally. Remember those angles that we've talked about before. They can go on any of those angles. They can be delivered behind you at this angle. They can be delivered out to the sides with both hands, shoving people away or striking them. But that's an idea, gives you an idea of how to use this strike. And I've done seminars and demonstrations where I've done nothing but heel palm strikes throughout the whole thing. It's a comfortable way for hitting. It's one of my favorite ways. Now, if Rick would come up and help me a little bit, I'll show it, give you an idea of how they can be used. <clears throat> now, for instance, if Rick rushed up to grab me around the waist, this would be considered a bear hug grab. All right? Now, as he stepped in, rather than try and punch, I can step. Just come on in. And as I step, I can at this point now <laughs> hit with the heel of the hand. Now, if you notice, now I'm going to turn his back towards you. As he gets hit with this hand, it only sets up the other heel palm from this angle as well. And what I'm doing is just as the attempt is made, I'm off-stepping off Rick, and I'm moving up diagonally. And as, it was as if my whole arm was no more than a stick I'd picked up and decided to hit with it. Okay, now... Another way of using it, if Rick is upright, if you bring him up with the bottom of this hand, which can come up diagonally and strike, and you can't see it quite at this angle, but you'll see as he comes up. As he comes up and lifts his head up, I'm back into a cat stance. Now, if I want to use an overhead strike this way, I can break right across the collarbone and break it this way. I can reverse the heel palm. Catch it down in the groin. What stance am I in? We've learned this before, but a reversible. That gives you an idea of how it can work. If somebody's behind you, <laughs> and you decide to use the heel palm strike this way, it works well because it fits the target. I can buckle, and we've learned this before, but I can use it as such. I can use it underneath by keeping it fixed in position. And again, your imagination can run away with you as you use it and so forth. It can be used in a freestyling situation. Come on over here, put your guard up. We've knocked punches down with the fist. We've knocked punches down with the edge of the hand. We can also use it to knock down with the heel palm. And as I reach that point, I can push, shove, whatever I want to do with it. Thank you, Rick. All right, now, so we're going to have to learn not only how to thrust it, but to use it in an overhead fashion as well. Like I said, horizontally, turn it over, bring it across to your other shoulder, and do an outward horizontal heel palm. Do an inward horizontal heel palm, and make sure that you don't do it dry. Now, what I mean by dry is this. There's nothing in that. But as I move, I center myself, 
I put a little tension in the arm, not too much, because I don't want to be what we call constipated in motion, but enough tension to get some energy going in it. We're going to use it underneath, striking if we we're going to hit somebody in the groin area in front of us, behind us the same way. Practice it, one going overhead into a forward bow, and then one going back to strike somebody in the groin. This hits another person where? possibly in the bridge of the nose. Learn to reverse it. Remember how we covered? We can cover and reverse it. On this guy, hit him in the top, and the other guy down in the groin area, and so forth. Practice shuffling with him. As you shuffle, strike with it as if you would a punch. Practice crossing behind and hitting the person behind you. And this stance is no more than a twist stance. And if I unwind, I can catch somebody over on this side. Now we're getting pretty involved because we got a guy at 12, another guy at 6. We're unwinding with a guy at what? 9. And as he gets hit, whoa, the guy at 3 o'clock gets hit. All right, now if I go into a twist stance, the guy at this angle, which is what? 2. This is 4. Then I can step out, catch the guy over here at 10, and this guy at 4 o'clock. All right, now, we say, well, that's, you're fighting more than one person. Exactly. But we do have a tape coming up where we are going to be working in mass attacks. And we've got to cover these angles. And I'll use, mass, use this strike in these mass attacks, and you'll see where it's applied. All right, the next strike that I want to work on is called the back knuckle strike. And this is probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular, strike in the Kempo system. The back knuckle strike has, well, it's, it's really considered a new weapon as far as martial arts go. When it, the Kempo first came to the United States, still most people were using punches and kicks and so forth. But a back knuckle strike is no more than a backhand with the fist close. All right? And in the early days of tournament fighting, back knuckles weren't considered to be a legal way of gaining a point at a tournament because they didn't feel that it had the power of the punch. But uh, as they found out, as more Kempo practitioners came up on the scene, that was not the case at all. In fact, the back knuckle was just as powerful, if, if not more powerful, because of the speed that is generated by it. You've got to understand that in American boxing, they outlawed the backhand for the simple reason is that it created too much power, generated too much centrifugal force from the body, and it would literally break the jaw of their opponent, of the other boxer, or, or break his neck. So it's an extremely powerful weapon, if you know how to use it properly. Now, I'm going to show it to you from this this angle, I'm in a right neutral bow, weight distribution is even. I want you just to drape your left hand down so it's out of the way right now. Now the right fist, the palm is down and crossed over as if you were almost going to fast draw to the left side of your body. I'm using my right arm. And as I look at my opponent, and if I was going to strike to the head, I'd first move with the elbow. And then when I ran out of elbow, I would let it launch itself and strike with the back of the two forward knuckles here. All right, now you can strike with the back of the hand flat. You can even arch the wrist, depending upon the situation. The important thing is, though, is that you don't launch it this way, is that you launch it first with the elbow so that you have economy of motion. It's a new word, by the way. I keep slipping these in, but we're going to be using them throughout our, our films. Now, we start with the elbow, and as soon as I run out of it, whap, I let this whip out towards my opponent. And it's this whipping motion is where it gains its power. All right, now, you can practice it with both hands, meaning have the left hand come up with it so you're checked or protected. And there's that word checked again. A lot of times when I practice or I'm teaching, I'll leave that hand just dangling so that it's out of our way. But now I want you to practice it both ways. This is a check, and here's your back knuckle strike. Now, with the help of Rick, I'll give you some examples. Rick, would you come over here, please? Right neutral bow. Now, the reason I told you to put this check in, because we're going to use it now. We're going to start using this check. So when I teach we weapons, strikes, kicks, whatever, I'm going to also start including the opposite hand or leg in a checking position. That's not real important right now, but be aware of it. Now, with his arms down, if you take a look at it, if I put a step drag, he's a little bit out of reach, so I'm going to use a step drag to reach Rick. I'll do it slow. I'm going to move up, and as I begin the step, you already see my elbow going. 
And just as I get there, bam, that's where I'm going to let this thing whip, and that's where it creates its power. And also, as I get there, I center my body, I isolate my body, and so I almost grip the ground. I solidify my base, so as I solidify it, it has a way of launching or centrifugal force or, or whipping it. You might say if you take a whip and you hold the handle, and as you launch the whip out, suddenly before the end hits, you pull back, that's where the snap is created. And the noise you hear is the end of the whip breaking the sound barrier. Well, basically the same thing. You want to look at your body as a handle. And just before you hit, or you pull back just a little bit, or center just a little bit, whap, and it gives a tendency of putting a whip on the end of it. Now, if his guard is up, I can go through, through the guard, whap, break it this way. Right? I can break down the guard, go into a punch, or whatever I want to do. Or as I broke that guard down, I can break it down, whap, and go right up to the back knuckle and back again. Or, remember the checking hand? I can check the arm down as I move. Now, it's very versatile. I'm using it up at a diagonal. Remember that angle, the diagonal line at this point. If I go up and he blocks my back knuckle, then I just go down the opposite diagonal. Not the opposite, but the one that's underneath. Pop, and catch him in the ribs this way. As the hand goes down again, I'm right back up again and back. It's very versatile. It's very deadly. I had a friend, another martial artist, that was carrying his groceries out from a grocery store late at night, and he got attacked by about three or four guys. He didn't want to drop his groceries. He said, he said not this time. He said, I couldn't afford it. And he used nothing but a back knuckle strike to ward these guys off. He never did drop his groceries, but he did drop the attackers. All right, good. Thank you, Rick. Now, practice this back knuckle strike with a shuffle in particularly. It's not something that you generally want to use with a step through. It can be used, but generally, if you're going to step through with a back knuckle, you use the back hand because by the time your body comes around, you can whip it out from this position. But I want you to get used to using it first in a shuffling position. As you step, the check comes up to protect you because this thing's going to be launched. So work it in this position, forward, as well as working it in reverse. Switch with it. Reverse it. Come up to a cat stance. And as you come up to a cat stance, let it whip out. Switch your cat stance. Come in. Step back into your neutral. Use it a little more horizontally, as if you were going down to what? Possibly down to his rib cages. Crossover. Use it on a guy behind you and a guy in front at the same time. You can unwind. Use it from a side horse stance. But this will give you an idea of how this should be used. If you work it from a horse stance, you can work it out like this. But what happens from a horse stance, it becomes almost, it's half a punch and half a back knuckle. I'd rather see you learn it at this stage in the game as a whipping motion. Practice it. Come, you can come out with your elbow halfway and use it this way, or you can use it just from that position itself. But how you use it, develop it and be relaxed. Speed, if people ask me, well, where do you get your speed? One of the key ingredients, not the only ingredient, but one of the key ingredients is to stay relaxed. And from a relaxed state, you can suddenly rise to the given situation. But if you're tense first, it tenses your breathing, it controls your thoughts in the wrong way, and it isolates you, so you can't move. But if you're relaxed and you're calm, you can always tense up to move, and so forth. So practice it in a shuffle from a loose, relaxed state, and then just as you think you're hitting your imaginary target, whoop, then tense up, but then relax again and come back. Good. All right, the next basic strike that I want to work on is a specialized strike and involves the fingers. We call them finger strikes. They're extremely versatile, and they're extremely powerful if used properly. All right, if it's used improperly, you can hurt your own fingers. That's obvious. But they are a very specialized weapon, and that's to be remembered. And generally, when you speak of striking with your fingers, most people think, well, immediately he's thinking about going to the eyes. Well, that's not entirely true, although it is one of the places that you do go to for this. 
But it has, it takes training, it takes developing, and the old practitioners used to take their fingers and develop calluses on them and develop the muscle strength by twisting their hands or thrusting their fingers into sand, into buckets of pebbles and so forth. But it's not necessary because in Kimpel, we pick soft targets and we like to go hard, for instance, my knuckles, to a soft target. We generally don't go soft or hard. And likewise with the fingers, we want to go to a target that's a little softer than the finger itself. I'm going to give you examples of finger striking, and we're going to start from a horse stance. Number one, like a punch, we're going to do a straight finger thrust. Now, there's a number of ways of thrusting your finger straight out at your opponent. And one of which I want you to begin to learn is to take your hand, hold it up straight, take your middle finger and bend it so it's flush or in line with the other fingers. Keep the hand straight. You don't want it bent like this, but you want the hand flat on the bottom, flat up here on the wrist. And that's going to be your striking surface. Now, oddly enough, these three fingers in a line happen to be the width of the average human eye. And you'll find that to many parts of your body are lined up this way. And you've cock it from the hip. You're going to bring it out just like you would a punch. You're going to torque it. When that elbow reaches the end of the rib cage, you're going to torque it out. So you strike with those fingers. Now, if you're going to strike with this type of finger configuration, this middle finger acts as a little shock absorber. It also makes it so that if you hit something harder than a soft target, you're not going to break your fingers. All right. Now, if you look at it from an angle, you come out from your hip, begin to torque. You can use a forward bow to accentuate that strike, and that's how it should be applied. You can thrust it, or you can what? Snap it into position. Now, that's a straight finger thrust. Keeping this configuration, you can go to a vertical just like you would a vertical punch. You can go to half, not even a turn as you would on this punch and have the palm facing up. You can turn past the point and go all the way inverted, not all the way inverted, but partially inverted as well. It's a very powerful, strong finger te technique. Now, besides the finger th thrust, I want you to practice and learn how to use what we call the spear hand, okay, that's a common name for it. And a knife hand, you could call it that. Basically, it's considered a spear hand. A spear hand can be used this way. It can be used this way. We're going to practice this one. And all you do is you take the little finger, next finger, the middle finger here, and bend them back so that the hand is flexed, and you're poking strictly with the index finger. All right. This can be practiced just like the straight finger thrust as well. Now, that involves poking or thrusting or spear-like motion, but your fingertips are more versi versatile than that. You can take the fingers themselves, and like the end of a whip, they're like a tassel. And from that position, you can throw your fingers out at your opponent, and it looks harmless until you actually hit something, because these are going to travel so fast, as I'll show you when I have Rick come up here and demonstrate. So they can act as a whipping motion in front of you. They can act as a whipping motion behind you. All right. They can act like a back knuckle. Remember the back knuckle strike? Well, instead of using the back knuckles, now we're going to use the finger whips from this position. But it's a loose, relaxed hand, as it's doing. They can be used in a clawing, like the heel palm strike. You can start from a left neutral bow, pivot to a forward bow, and as the heel palm hits, the fingers can go on and rake. From that point, they can twist, they can gouge, fingers can hook, thumbs can gouge. That gives you an idea of how this can be used. If Rick would come up, he'll help me, and I'll show you, give you a little better idea of what we're talking about. If you come over here, just go down to horse. Now, if you go to a right neutral bow and put your guard up, because the fingers and the hand is not clenched close, the strike is extremely fast because that means that the entire arm is loosed. Now, you know that a back knuckle is fast. I showed you that. But the, the fastest hand strike you have are the finger strikes, especially if they're being used in a whipping motion. Now, depending upon the situation that arises, your conscience is going to dictate what you use on the street. If his fists are up, 
And it's not a fight to the death. At least you don't think it is. Or if it's just some drunk, you don't stick your finger in his eyes. That's my belief. What you do, that's your own. You let your own conscience be your guide on this. But I'm going to show you the extreme of it, because if there was a knife sticking in that hand, or a gun, then you're going to have to take drastic measures. And yes, you are going to have to go to the eyes, maybe to the throat, to the groin area with your fingers. But again, they're, they're very quick. And if you look at my hand, if I check his arm down from this position, if I do a re very relaxed motion, it's in and it's out before the opponent knows it. Now, look at it from this angle. As I said, if I knock this down from here, it's out and back. Now, what looked like one motion was really one whipping across that eye and, then, and the other one hooking on the way back. Okay, now, his guard is up. If you don't want to use it as a whipping, we could come across and use it as a poke right up into it. And then you can slip the thumb and gouge if you have to, grab onto the face and twist. So now we're getting the different varieties of it. As one hand can come back up to whip, one can come down simultaneously and catch the groin. Now we can slice, and that slice went one, two, brought the head back again. We can come underneath the throat and back up and slice down. If we're working a technique which involves other strikes, we can come off with, a, say for instance, a hand sword, go to a finger poke. Now we can use straight finger thrust, bring him forward, and cross out. And as we cross out, we can sweep this way and catch the eye, this time with the little fingers. Remember I told you that the hand sword is like an all-purpose weapon? Instead of catching it with the poke with these two fingers, I caught it with the little fingers at this point. If he came in with a straight left punch and I stepped off and block, I can use my block and from there slip it up to the eye poke here. I can step off from here with a heel palm, and as a heel palm hits, the fingers now can grab, okay, and be applied here, and anchoring my elbow is going to give me even more leverage. Now if I come around with a hand sword, the hand sword hits, the fingers pull, rip, and out. So you might say that they're an extension of whatever the strike is. If it's just a hammer, a hand sword, it can hit, wrap around, pull and gout. You can slip another one in as well. You can continue to do this. You can sweep. Use your own arm as a guide and poke to give you an idea. All right, now so far in our strikes, we've gone from the fingertips down to the elbow, but we bypassed the middle of the arm, or what you might call the forearm. We're going to use the inside of the forearm as a strike as well as the outside of the forearm. Now forearm striking is extremely powerful. It builds up a tremendous amount of centrifugal force. As you take, for instance, from a left neutral bow, and you solidify your base by dropping your weight, and starting to pivot from a neutral to what? To a left forward bow. It has a tendency to throw those arms out away from you. All right? Now, using an inside forearm, it can be used on a diagonal. It can be used on a horizontal. It can diagonal this way, however you want to use it. You can step back now and use it inverted. That means this is a forearm, but the palm is facing up now. So you can use it this way as well. Then we have an outward forearm. Instead of using the inside, we use the outside of the arm in this fashion. And again, it can follow any angle that you want to use it on. I'm going to show you both here with Rick. Now, OK, Rick, go to a left neutral bow. If Rick faces me in a left neutral bow and he steps through with the right punch, as he steps, I step off and I block. With what kind? But a left inward block. Now watch again. He punches, I make my block. From here, I can use a number of strikes, but in particular, I can use this forearm strike. I can shuffle, and as I make my shuffle, I can double Rick over at this point. Now, as I hit him, notice my wide kneel stance. Remember how we used that before? Well, now I'm going to come up diagonally pop, to use my entire forearm to hit Rick. OK, now, if you watch, we just worked finger techniques prior to the forearm, didn't we? See this hand up here? You see the face from this position. While I go to my forearm here, this hand is going to come up 
but that's just icing on the cake. But I want you to know it's, it exists and it's there. If you take a situation <clears throat> where Rick dives to hit me, grab me around the waist, pop, the heel pump can hit and the forearm can hit at this point as well. Now, let's take a situation where <clears throat> Rick is grabbing my shoulder. It's the easiest one to work with. If I drop back and buckle his leg, I can't really use a forearm from here. It doesn't look like it, does it? But now, if I buckle the inside of left, uh, Rick's left leg, his head is going to move to the right and drop down. Okay, so as we do that, we know that's going to happen from the buckle. See his head move over and drop? If that's the case, as he drops, we'll let it drop into what? A forearm strike. Now that was an upward forearm. Now I can use what? Pop! The back of my, the outside of the forearm at that position as well. If I want to use it a little differently, I can have Rick grab my wrist, take a wrist grab, and we hit, and we do a number of other strikes. Now as I begin to buckle Rick, I can complement the angle of his back and use the forearm in this fashion as well. So there's a number of ways that it can be applied. Thank you, Rick. What I suggest is that you practice it particularly with a shuffle, down to a wide kneel and or a closed kneel stance. You get used to using it. Now this is one incident where it looks like the arm is totally straight, but it's not. There is a slight bend left in my elbow, so I don't snap my own arm when I make contact. <clears throat> but practice it from your neutral stances. All right, step back and use the outside of the arm this way. Make it smooth, come through, practice them in figure eights. So you go from the outside, inside, back to the outside again. So far we've discussed hand techniques, but I want to take it just a little step further. And I want to take in, and so that you're conscious of using every part of your body as a weapon. And I want to go to what we call a headbutt. I know it's not part of the hand. But I want you to think about it now, and I'm going to use the shoulder as a weapon as well, because later on in more advanced tapes that we're going to do, we're going to have more advanced striking. But this will lead you into it just a little bit. Now, with the help of Rick, I'll explain what I'm talking about and show you at the same time. Now, the head, most people think, well, can I strike with the head without injuring myself? Well, yes, providing that you find a soft target. Now, remember, we don't go hard to hard. Likewise, you know, we don't want knuckles going right to a hard bony part. Yeah, you'll hurt his chin and you'll break it, but you'll also break your knuckles in the process, unless you've been pounding bricks and boards for the last six months. But that's not to the point. The point of it is, is to pick a soft target. And you can use the butt of your head if you grab, pull him in, and hit the bridge of the nose. Come up underneath the eye. Come up underneath the chin, okay? These areas here, bridge of the nose, up underneath, even into the throat, okay, and so forth, won't hurt you. All right, but don't go forehead to forehead because you'll knock him out and you'll both will be meditating in a horizontal position. Now, bridge of nose, excellent target. If I'm grabbing what's called a full Nelson attack, and as I'm being grabbed, if I manage to arch my back and suddenly butt with my head at the same time, it's going to have a, des a devastating effect. All right, now, besides using your head, People have been known to use their shoulders, and in Kempo we do that too. If my hands were trapped for any reason, tied behind me, in my pockets because it was cold, and if he attacked from that position to grab, the shoulder itself can be used. And then from that point, the headbutt can come in as I go to a forward bow could be used. And again, the shoulder can be used as a weapon. Thank you, Rick. It's a little different. But you've got to remember, football players use their shoulders. They also use their heads. They have helmets. It's advanced, and like I said, we'll get into more advanced striking with the entire part of the body in later tapes. But just, uh, I want you to start to be in a, abreast of what's coming up. I hope you enjoyed this tape. This covers the hand strikes that I want you to learn at this stage. There are more. There are different ways of striking with the hands, as well as the fingers, the elbow, even part of the bicep can be used, depending on the situation. Practice it. Remember to practice your hand strikes, not just in stances, in stance changes, but practice them 
and, and shuffles all types of foot maneuvers. Get used to using them. And good luck in your training.